Thank you for those kind words, and uh, thank you for allowing my son to do that. I didn't know he was going to do that. I thought he was just coming up here on his own for a little bit there, but um, but I appreciate that very much. He um, uh, he is always trying to help the Lord in some way. I'm very proud to be his father, and uh, he's always trying to get involved with preaching or singing or uh, quoting scripture or something of that nature. So. I appreciate uh, the kindness uh, to allow him a few moments up here. Um, I appreciate the congregation here at Milestone. You, you mean so much to this area. And not just this area, but to several areas in the United States and, and the kingdom in general. I appreciate the elders here and the good work that you do. Um, and specifically in northwest Florida, as was mentioned, I'm the preacher at the J Church of Christ, which is about 50 minutes in the other direction. Um, right below the Alabama line, and we're just probably as far north as you can get in Florida at, in that particular place. Uh, but we appreciate the good work that uh, Milestone, the Northwest Florida School of Biblical School Studies, um, does. We appreciate the young men, the caliber of young men that are coming from this school, the training that they're receiving. Uh, most of the time, whenever I'm out of town, it's one of the students that usually comes to fill in in my place. And so we appreciate their hard work, and we appreciate what they do. I have been involved in, in various different ways with this school over the years, and I appreciate uh, it's your great work and appreciate what Guyton has brought to this program as well. Um, but to this lesson is what we're here for. Someone once said, those who cannot learn from history, if I can learn how to do this PowerPoint, we'll be all right. All right, whoa. There we go. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In other words, if we keep making the same mistakes, we're going to keep making the same mistakes, right? Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Over the years, some have departed from the New Testament pattern, departed from the teachings which are found in the Word of God. My son, he is a... Uh, Y'all just saw him, Jackson. He's seven years old. He's also, he's homeschooled. My wife is a stay-at-home mother. She homeschools our kids. And, and the last couple of weeks, she's been kind of out of commission. She had our, our two-week-old a uh, little while back. So I've been trying to fill in uh, catching up the last of the school year uh, with our son. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed is he has a history book. And I love history. And he has a history book. It's called The Usborn uh, Time Traveler or, or something. Anyway... It's the, the, the idea is that it has a little boy that will put a time travel mask on and he'll go back in time and he flies over Egypt and he goes and sees what they did. And he goes to Greece and he will see what they did. And he'll go to Rome and he'll see uh, about these different... And it's really a great concept to teach young people, uh, to try to immerse them in that culture to teach it to, so they can learn. Uh, and so what I want us to do this morning, I want us to put our little time travel helmet on. And go back in time. I want us to go back to a time uh, in the first century. In Acts chapter 2. Let's say we'll go back and we, we just heard that, that first gospel sermon from, from the apostle Peter. And we had 3,000 obey the gospel that day. And they're dripping wet from the watery grave of baptism, right? And we, we land down and we go up and we ask them. And we say, hey, let me ask you something. What denomination are you a part of? I submit to you, they would have no idea what you're talking about. They would have no clue. Why? Because denominationalism didn't start for many more years. It, it, would, it, it would be a result of error. A, a pattern in which people would fall away from the truth. Over the years, many have departed from the true teaching of God whether that be because of greed, whether that be because of corruption, whether that be because of false teaching, whether that be because of whatever. People have left from the faith. And this was prophesied. 
The Apostle Paul, when speaking to his young protege Timothy, when, remember he was in, this was his uh, imprisonment that was just prior to his death. He was in a Roman Im imprisonment. He was about to be beheaded in the time of Nero. And he writes a letter to his young protege, his young son in the faith, Timothy, in, in, Second Tim in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4 and verses uh, 2 through 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, they're going to go after teachers who tell them what they want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. I love that part of that particular scripture because uh, to me it just kind of it makes it all very clear. When we tell our children bedtime stories, we tell them myths, we may tell them a, a, about a princess and a captain or, or whatever the case may be. We tell them stories. We tell them fables. We tell them something that is pretend. These folks would rather turn away from the truth and turn their ears to pretend stories. Something that has not substance. And that would be sad. Because of false ways would lead to departures of various different times, times uh, uh, and kinds and that would lead to Catholicism. Uh, and Catholicism would become so bad, so grossly uh, in, in, in engorged with murder and, and, and power and pride and false ways. It would become so bad that people wanted to get out. And the Protestant movement would arise. And that's what this week has been about. That's what uh, the last year's lectureship was about. That's a, and it's a beautiful study to look into religious history, to go back in time and put our little mask on and see what was going on. Unfortunately, Catholicism would lead to Protestantism and it would move, lead to every movement from this or that and every wind of doctrine that we might face today. Today, when you go down the streets, it's not like the time when we put our little mask on and we went to Acts chapter 2 and we asked them what denomination they're a part of. No, 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 no. It's not like that today because in that time there was but one church. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Not a group of different denominations which range in thousands of different teachings. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Ephesians 4, there's seven things in which are mentioned that are only but one. And one, one of those things are there is but one body, which is the church. Jesus prayed for it. I appreciate the brother the last hour going into that uh, about uh, the unity which is involved in the church. Yeah, he preached a lot of my lesson for me and I appreciate that. It, it uh it gives us an understanding of what the church is. And, and Jesus had no plan for it to be divided up, for it to be the way it is today. That was not God's doing. That was man's doing. And we have got a problem. Over time, error has begotten error. And my goal for this lesson is for us to consider that error. Now, why do people teach things in such ways? Uh, here's one explanation, and maybe it'll help us to understand a few things. The book of 2 Peter is all about false teachers, by the way. I would suggest if you ever get a chance just to read the book from start to finish. Read it as it would have been designed to do so in the, in the first century. Read the whole book. You'll, you'll grasp the concept uh, a lot better. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 specifically uh, talks about individuals, talks about how some uh, things in the Word of God are hard to understand. There are some scriptures you read, you won't automatically get it all of a sudden. Some things are hard to be understood. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Now that's not the type of rest that you and I may do after this session. That rest is the same way as wrestle. W-R-E-S-T. Wrestle. It means to twist or to fight against. Uh, they that are unlearned and un are unstable, they twist the scriptures. And they'll lead other people astray, but they'll also do so unto their own destruction. This evening, it will be my goal to go over the departure 
which we call Quakerism. The Quakers. I do not have an early period of time frame in history like some of the speakers may have had. I don't have a later period of time frame. I don't have a specific doctrine uh, of one type or another. I have the Quakers, <laughs> which means I've got to cover everything from the beginning. I've got to t show the history of it. I've got to show what they teach today and how we can preach. And, 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 and also, uh, I, I, Brother Wesley mentioned last hour something I greatly appreciated. He mentioned how uh, we need to find common ground with those whom we teach. Start there. I think that's a beautiful concept to have when teaching somebody the gospel. So in this lesson, what we'll try to do is what they did right. We'll try to go over what they did right and what we can do like them. But we're also going to go over what they have done that's outside of the scriptures. And so um, with that saying, let's get right to it. Who are the Quakers? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, there's a story behind why I have this on the screen. Um, Gotten called me, and he asked me, he said, Josh, I'd like for you to be on the lectureship next year. And, and so I, I said, I, I'm grateful for the, the, in, in the invite. I'm honored, and I, I'll be, I'm very thankful that you thought of me. I'll try to do my best and, and present something uh, at the lectureship. And then he called me back, and he said, I want you to handle the Quakers. Okay, yes, sir. And I got a phone and I said, who are the Quakers? <laughs> I had uh, I'd heard a little bit about them in the past. Uh, the only thing I really knew was that there was an oatmeal and that was similar to them uh, that was named after the specific Quakers. I didn't necessarily, I've never really dove down into that topic religiously, but I have now. And so to, today we're going to try to learn who they are and where they come from and what they do, and how we can teach such individuals. Who are the Quakers? The Quakers are known as the Religious Society of Friends. That's not their actual name, by the way. Their actual name is not the Quakers. It's the Religious Society of Friends. We've heard throughout the week that different individuals got their names uh, from something that is... Uh, really a derogatory term. The Methodists were called Methodists because people were uh, at first wanting to uh, degrade them by calling them Methodists. The Lutherans got what well, they called uh, the Lutherans uh, originally because people were trying to degrade them. And the Quakers are that like that way as well. Uh, the Quakers, their name is the Religious Society of Friends. But it, the Quaker term was originally meant to, to degrade them, but the group would eventually embrace it. Now, the name Quaker comes from something involved in their worship. The name Quaker comes from the quaking that would sometimes be uh, of an uh, agitated religious feeling. Let me explain that. Uh, when you go in, because I have to cover all of the religion, not just the beginning, I, I want to talk about what, how they worshiped. They call it meeting. They don't say, I'm going to worship. We're going to meeting. We're going to meeting with friends, uh, a friend's meeting. And when you walk into the meeting uh, with the Quakers, what you're going to notice is something similar to this outside the door. They would have a sign basically sit telling people, you need to be quiet. No time to talk anymore. You know, I hate, the, oh, I hate doing announcements at the church. I, I, I hate it. I, 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 would, I would not choose to do that in any way. But I have to do them every Sunday, and I get up and do the announcements. And the reason why I hate it is because everybody's laughing and carrying on and hugging and shaking hands and how's your mama and, and everything's going like that way. And then I have to stop all that and get everybody round up because if I don't, then we're going to be late getting out and so on and so forth. Well, when you walk into services there, there is no laughing. There is no uh, talking. It is complete silence. That's what's designed. You stop talking when you enter into the building. And you sit in silence. And you sit in silence. And you sit in silence. And you don't say a word. Sometimes it may be for 30 minutes. Sometimes it might be for an hour. Sometimes it may be for more. They sit in silence until one has a quaking feeling. 
until otherwise what they believe to be the guidance of the Holy Spirit comes upon someone and they will tell a message, preach a message. Now what they call their worship is unprogrammed worship. They will not have um, a list of songs. They will not have anything to guide us uh, or to make things in order. They, they do not feel like that is, uh, should be a part of the worship. So they will not have a list of the hymns in which they'll be singing. They won't sing from a particular hymn book. Some of them will not. Uh, they won't have scripted prayers or scripted sermons. Nothing could be pre-thought up, so to speak. It's called unprogrammed worship. And they sit silent, silently until someone has a message come to them. And then they speak the message. Sometimes, sometimes the message will be just a few words. Sometimes the message, and this is from their teachings, not mine. Uh, sometimes the message will be that, uh, that it's, it only applies to me. Sometimes it's a message that I need to share with everybody. Sometimes they say you can dance a message. I don't know how you can teach very much from dancing the message, but you can dance a message or you can walk a message. Whatever the case may be, the message will come after a long period of silence. And that silence is broken with a message. And after the message is done, you'll know it's done because everybody starts shaking hands. And that's how it's over. And then the services will be dismissed and they can have uh, their different uh, activities to go along with, with each other, um, and so on. Now, you say, well, how did they get to this place? Who are the Quakers? Where did this originate from? It's not just oatmeal, folks. They are a group of a religious body of people who are very confused. And so we have to look at history to understand how they got to where they are. I appreciate the fact that we did the Methodist church uh, just prior to this lesson because John Wesley got his teachings from the, the idea uh, of the England, uh, the Reformation movement as it was happening in England. So is that which happened with the Quakers. Uh, that was a product of the Reformation movement as it came into England. You'll remember that uh, King Henry VIII, he, he wanted to divorce his wife, and so he started his own church. He started the, King, the Church of, of England. And so there is a, a, a time in the history of England when people who did not want to worship with the Church of England and were pulling away and different uh, organizations were beginning to start. The Lord's Church was prominent in England at that time, and we'll get there later. They're the Church of Christ, a very interesting book in which you can study and I've referenced several times in this particular, this, this lesson is the traces of the kingdom. You can look through the, the religious history of the church in England. Uh, and, and so that was beginning there. But who are these people and how did they get to this uh, particular belief? Well, in the 17th century, a man by the name of George Fox was who, the, who founded the Quakers. A man by the name of George Fox. And in the 1640s, he was a young man, and he lived in the English Midlands. And he left his home, and he traveled around the country. Remember, this country is a country that's filled with reform. They're going through a lot of uh, spiritual questions, and who's right and who's wrong, and what's the right way to worship God. And, and, and so he goes on a spiritual quest. And he, there was a lot of people seeking to reform the Church of England. And over the course of this journey, he started meeting people that just like him wanted a more direct spiritual experience. They didn't really want to be taught more about what the Bible said. They wanted a more direct spiritual experience. What I mean by that, folks, they wanted to have a good feeling as opposed to have a, an intelligent thought. I'm not trying that to uh, say that to belittle them in any way, but that's just the case. They were in search of a spiritual experience. And so Quakerism uh, was a result of, of this man, uh, George Fox, and his founding. Another key player in, in this particular movement is a woman by the name of Margaret Fell. And in 1652, the Quakers started meeting in her home, and she became a, a large part of that. Margaret Fell and George Fox eventually became, they, they were married in 1667. 
But it, it, forward from that, entire congregations started converting into Quakerism. They would go and preach and teach and, and, and pull entire congregations in. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. Within a decade, 20 to 60,000 converts were happening in, and the numbers vary for, from historical portions, but up to, could be up to 60,000 within a decade sprung about in this congregation or these groups of people in England. It was a rapid growing religion and it moved into the New World as well. It moved into America. In the 1650s they already had missionaries going over into America trying to teach others. Some of the first ones were in Maryland and Virginia. But I want you to remember one thing. Is the a man by the name of William Penn. William Penn was one of the first and most prominent Quakers of that time. Anybody ever heard of Pennsylvania? Okay. Pennsylvania became a, uh, a ground of um, where all of them could come and feel safe from religious persecutions. Um, in Pennsylvania, would, they, there would be a high uh, involvement of the Quakers there. In 1681, King Charles uh, II gave William Penn, an English Quaker, a large grant to, uh, to uh, in uh, American, American land to pay off the debt to his family, in which he owed his family. And so that land grant was Pennsylvania. And the, the Quakers, and the reason why they would need this safe haven to go to, is the Quakers were not liked by most people. They didn't swear oaths like all the other folks. They didn't participate in the Church of England, so they were kind of outcasts. Um, one of their leaders, a man named James Naylor, uh, he was really not liked at all from the way he would uh, be obnoxious in his preaching and he would go up and disrupt preachings and so on and so forth. And so he, the Quakers were not liked in England. As a matter of fact, um, on May 24th in 1689, uh, the Act of Toleration was passed in the English Parliament. And what that was a big deal because what that did was it said that nonconformist, nonconformist to the Church of England, could have now their own place of worship and their own preachers. Except two people. <laughs> two groups of people could still, still could not have their own place of worship and their own preachers. Uh, that was the Catholics because of what they had done leading up to that. They didn't want the Catholic Church to infiltrate and come back in. And the Quakers. Just because they didn't like them. Uh, they, they really didn't like them at all. Uh, they, they say that, that, that several thousand Quakers were imprisoned in England, and I think about 500 of them died in prison. So they were persecuted, but they, much like the persecution of the early church, they, uh, they used persecution to spread their belief system. Uh, they felt like martyrs, and they would keep going and going and going. They weren't liked in America either. They were, they were despised throughout the colonies. Actually, four of them, four Quakers were put to death in Boston in the early 1600s. And so they needed somewhere like Pennsylvania to go and know they could have religious freedoms. Know they could go to a place where they could, uh, could be and, and, <coughs> excuse me, and they could have uh, this rest. Now, before we go on... Um, one of the things that I want to mention, and there's some more about this in the book you can learn about when George Fox was thrown over a wall by another preacher. And you, I mean, there's just a lot of times like that that actually happens. Only you can look there, and for time's sake, we won't mention it. Um, but one thing I want to mention, mention before we move on is that this specific religious group has its roots in the Church of Christ. The Quakers came from congregations of the Church of Christ. And you say, how does that happen? That's the, that's the Church of the New Testament. How, how, does, how, how do we have the truth and then go away into something that is so far different? I believe it was weak leadership. And I'll tell you why I believe that shortly. The church in England faced every wind of doctrine during that time period. Time period. Um, what they would face uh, would be, they, they faced Calvinism, they faced the, the foot washing. Even there was a doctrine that said you couldn't sing in worship. Because the, and it evolved from people trying to be quiet 
uh, and not sing to alarm the authorities. And that developed into a doctrine that you know, it was sinful to sing during the congregation. And so it, it, it was, there's a lot of stuff going on, but there's also large groups that would come in and convert entire congregations like the Seekers or the Ranters or the Quakers. The founder of this era was a man named George Fox. His uncle was a member of the Lord's Church. His uncle was a member of the Lord's Church, a man by the name of um, uh, Picker, Pickering. His last name was Pickering. Anyway, he would have been very familiar with the ways of the church, visited with congregations, been there with his uncle. And when he started, when he got back from his spiritual quest and he started wanting to um, develop his own religion, and you'll see some of the tendencies as we go along, he wanted something with more a, di a direct spiritual experience. He actually wanted to be like the apostles. He was infatuated with the fact that the apostles were able to preach God's word directly through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He was infatuated by that, and he wanted to do that. And so he would say, I have a, he would go before a congregation of the Lord's church in England and say, I've, God's been given, has given me an opening. It's time for me to preach. And he would claim that God had given him a direct revelation. And he would teach. As a result of this, the Church of Christ, which met at Preston Park, south of Kendall in England, became Quakers after the preaching of George Fox in 1652. Just after that, another congregation in Furbank fell. Furbank, the, now get this, the Furbank fell, the members of the Church of Christ that lived there. When he went there, the entire congregation was converted to Quakerism. And that is considered the start of the Quaker movement, according to historians. It was a Church of Christ that completely converted. You say, well, how did that happen? There was a man named John Audlin and Francis Howgill. John Audlin and Francis Howgill. Those were the two elders of that congregation. Elders, do you think your job's important? It's so important to the church. These men, all those many years ago, I'm still mentioning their name today because they were weak. They were not strong in the faith. And these particular elders, well, they, they were fooled by George Fox, and they converted, and the entire congregation followed suit thereafter. And we should learn a very valuable lesson about the eldership here. In, in, in 1 Timothy and in Titus, we're given qualifications of elders, how the, what type of men they are to be, and how they are to lead the church. We ought to take that very seriously. It is more than an elder's job to pay the bills, okay? It is not the elder's job to figure out what kind of carpet we're going to put down. It is not, and now I'm not saying that's not important, because it can be. But it is, not, it is not the main focus of an elder in the Lord's church to be worried about how we're going to pay the electric bill. The worry, the importance of an elder in the body of Christ is to, is to shepherd the flock to try to keep, get those souls to heaven. In Acts 20 and verse 28, the church which Jesus Christ purchased with his blood, the elders have been made overseers of this church, the flock. Feed the flock. And so when we think about that, you, you know, a, a shepherd's hook, rod, whatever you want to call it, staff, when the sheep would get out of line and they start going away, uh, it's very easy. You just take that hook and you bring them by the neck and you bring them back in. And that's, that's the shepherd's job, right? For a Christian, when they start stepping out of line, they bring them back. They visit with them. They study with them. They, they, they worry about their souls. They got to be apt to teach so they can be able to... But that's not their only job. You know, that shepherd's rod had another purpose. 
You flip it upside down, and that's what they used to beat back the wolves with. Elders in the body of Christ need to be able to defend against error. Because the souls of the, of the flock that they shepherd are important. They will have to give an account for the job that they're doing. These elders, John Audlin and um, Francis um, uh, Halgill, are still mentioned today because they were weak, because they were unlearned and unstable. And they twisted the scriptures just like that man, uh, George Fox. And they went away into error. Now, well, let's see what these people actually got themselves into. Um, what do they believe? Because I don't just have to give you the history. I have to actually teach you what they believe. Many, if not all Quakers, consider themselves to be Christians. Some of Quakers don't even consider themselves to be Christians. They're just there for meditation or, or whatever the case may be. I, I don't know what it is. Um, but what they believe, uh, the Quakers have a long history of actively working for peace and opposing war. They all, most all consider themselves to be pacifist. Uh, they will not get themselves involved in government. That's why they had to step down in the government side in Pennsylvania because it was getting too much into that uh, against their pacifist beliefs. Uh, so they, they, they really try to stay out of politics. They refuse to take legal oaths. They will not have anyone in their services any kind of religious ceremonies they don't want to be a part of. They're preachers. They don't want them to have any kind of, uh, of special role. And I want you to notice this is the backlash of what was happening in Catholicism. The, the, the high and mighty priests, what was happening in the Church of England, they, they were so ceremonial, they had all these things that really weren't based in Scripture. And they were wanting to go the, other, the opposite direction from that. And, but one of the biggest things about the Quakers is their faith is based on more than the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished into all good works. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They have all truth, right? Why do they need any more truth? But their religion is based upon having a revelation. They call it an inner light. Every person... And they would say this. They'd say, everybody in this room has an inner light. And that's God inside of you. And then every person, if you'll just bring that inner light out, God will tell you what he wants you to know. And so that's why they sit in silence until the quake, until the inner light is brought out. And, and it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to nail down everything that they believe because you really don't know what's going to be danced out or walked out or hummed out or whatever. You don't know what's going to be said in that particular meeting. So it's hard to figure out exactly what they believe. But we do have an idea in some cases. Another thing they believe is they believe that women, men, everyone is created equal. And so everyone should have an equal say. You'll see um, uh, female preachers in these uh, particular denominations as well, the Quakers. Now, let's talk about some things they did right. Some things they did right. Uh, and we can take a lesson from them. God commands us to be a kind, benevolent, peaceful type of people, does he not? Be ye kind to one another and tender uh, hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Kind to one another. That's one of the first marks of being a Christian that the world notices about. You want to see the world figure. It. We understand what a Christian is, what a true New Testament Christian is. Someone that follows the precepts in the New Testament. We can spot a true New Testament Christian. But the world, you know how they spot one? How kind you are. How good you are to others. The things you do for people. That's just as much a commandment as anything else, by the way. 
We are to be good, benevolent, kind individuals as Christians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. We're to be kind to each other. We're to be good to the poor. Proverbs 28 and verse 27. To follow after things that make peace. Romans 14 and verse 9. Or verse 19. To love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 48. To do good to everyone. Galatians 6 and verse 10. That's what we're supposed to do. And the the Quakers do that pretty well. They have always responded to individuals regardless of race, regardless of their religion, regardless of their standing, regardless of what side of the track they live on. They have always been there to help others. The Quakers were one of the first individuals to advocate for the rights of Native Americans in this country. When everyone else thought they were savages, the, uh, the Quakers were the ones that stood up and advocated for their rights, their people. Did you know that the Quakers were the first in this country, one of the first, to advocate for the abolition of slavery, to have slavery abolished? In the 1700s, in Pennsylvania, they were already being told to sell their slaves and to stop buying and selling slaves. And by the end of the 1700s, they had, uh, it had been banned uh, in, in the Quakerism. They could not own, or buy, or sell slaves. We didn't do it for another hundred years in America uh, until, until the, after the Civil War, or during the Civil War, rather, and the, uh, and the Emancipation Proclamation. And so... Um, the Quakers have always been that way in different aspects of in the prison system. They were one of the first ones to advocate for, to have non-brutal uh, prisons, to have, have humane uh, circumstances in prisons. They were one of the first thing, ones to advocate for this in insane asylums. The way insane asylums the people were treated uh, yesteryear, the, the Quakers were the ones who advocated for that to, to cease. Uh, in 1947... Some of the Quakers won the Nobel Peace Prize for what they were doing. They, had, they were there when the, Nazis, when the Nazis had ruined the world in most areas. Guess who was there to pick up the pieces and help those people? The Quakers were. Now, they're very good people. Let me put this out here. I want to say, I teach this to our young people. Maybe it's too simplified. I don't know. But I'll say this. I'll say, good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Things I just mentioned, they are some good people. But they lack some principal findings of the New Testament. They did some things right, but they do some things wrong as well. Um, what well, some things that they did wrong? Well, as we said, some of it can be a little hard to nail down because of their belief system. Um, they believe that every individual has a right to give their own uh, scripture, their own revelation from God's word, and it's according to their inner light. And this can lead to a lot of error. Um, as a matter of fact, George Fox himself relating that his openings were a direct revelation from the Word of God. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. If it's an addition to the Word of God, it's too much. If it's less than the Word of God, it's not enough. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, if you add to, I'm going to add unto you the plagues that are written in this book. If you take away from it, I'm going to take away your name that's written in the book of life. That should instill fear into us. But yet, that's a part of their worship. That's the worship, the part of their worship that actually gained them their name. The quaking. The Bible is our guide, our primary guide, 
in order to figure out how to go to heaven. Their primary guide is their inner light, and they would, how they would describe it. One of the things that they do not teach, and as a matter of fact, George Fox went uh, a whole lot against, was baptism. You see, he saw baptism as just a showy way of doing things. He was so fed up with the way things were done in Catholicism and the Church of England, he, he saw things like the Lord's Supper and baptism as ways of just being showy. I don't want this ceremonial thing in our worship. We're going to be down to earth. The farmer's going to have the same input as this preacher over here. The man and the women, everybody's going to be equal. And we're going to sit around this room together. And it was appealing to some people. In that culture, that would have been very appealing. And he would go on, and you can read in the book different quotes that he would say about baptism and how he was uh, very much against that. Uh, but the Bible teaches very plainly what baptism is, that it was exemplified by Jesus. Jesus showed us the pattern in which we should go by when he was baptized. It was at every single conversion account when you look through the book of Acts, what do you find? Well, the Quakers find that they're converted by the inner light. That's how you're converted. That's how you're justified. When you have that feeling, that's not what the Scriptures teach. Every single conversion account throughout the book of Acts ends in baptism. Baptism is what puts us into Christ, where all spiritual blessings are found, Ephesians 1.3, where salvation is found. What puts us in Christ? Galatians 3.27, baptism puts us in Christ. What saves us? 1 Peter 3.21 says baptism saves us. Mark 16.16, 16, Jesus says that baptism saves us. Am I going to listen to George Fox or am I going to listen to Jesus? Baptism is what takes one's sins away. Um, Acts 22.16, Acts 2 and verse 38. They do not practice communion uh, in the same regard. Uh, they do not uh, want to and, and have that symbolism in their worship service. They say it takes away from the inner light. But that's a memorial. Jesus gave us this. He instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26. He, he, he gives us this communion, this memorial. What's a memorial mean? It means to remember. A memorial of what Christ has done for us. And we are to partake of it every first day of the week. Um, as a matter of fact, Acts 20 and verse 7 leads us to believe that that was the focal point of their worship. Some can make that argument at least. That they came together for that. They do not believe in hell the same way we do. Um, Jesus spoke of hell as a literal place. The same way he spoke of heaven as a literal place. That hell was a place prepared for the devil and, and his angels. It's, it's real and it's somewhere we will go if not right with God. They speak of hell as just a state of mind. They believe that one is justified by the inner light. The Bible teaches justification through the blood of Jesus. And we believe and show through the Romans chapter 6 that we can find uh, the benefits of the death of Jesus through the watery grave of baptism as we reenact the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Him. They believe that you, one, one can obtain a sinless perfection, that you can eventually be sinlessly perfect, not faithful, but sinlessly perfect through the help of the inner light. And they believe in females publicly teaching. You know, I'm not trying to be a male chauvinist. I'm not trying to go against the grain and make everybody upset. But what I am saying is that we believe what the Bible teaches. We speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible's silent, right? And the Bible teaches, and very specifically, in three different contexts from the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 11, and 1 Corinthians 14, that women are to keep silent in the assemblies. Now, I'm not... Why? Why? Because that's what God said. That should be enough. But the, the reasoning given in those particular uh, scriptures is based upon the order of creation. 
that Adam was made first, then Eve, and also the deception of Eve by Satan as a reason for those particular things. I didn't want this lesson to just be about what they did wrong. I want it to be about what they did right. I want us to understand that this is more than just oatmeal. You know, the Quakers are a group of people that started in the churches of Christ. But there was a false teacher that came along one day. And he was slick with his words. And there was a couple of elders that were not strong in the faith. And he converted them. And then he converted that congregation. And then he went on to convert congregation after congregation after congregation in England. And then they sent missionaries over to the United States and more and more and more and more. And now it's a denomination that we know of as the Quakers. And they're good people. They're very kind, benevolent, peaceful people. They're good people. But they're not saved people. And I pray that each of us will um, do what we can to reach out to those individuals, and not just them, but all those that might be uh, confused about something doctrinally. I love and appreciate this congregation. I appreciate this study that we can look back in time, put our, our, uh, our time goggles on, and look back to see what happened yesteryear, and to learn from those mistakes. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I pray this has been beneficial to you. Thank you for your time.